The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 797 for Monday, January 13th, 2020. <laughs> And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your tips, your questions, your cool stuff found. We take all the tips and cool stuff found and even questions that we come up with throughout the week. We mash them all together. We string them into an agenda and then we go through the agenda, answering the questions, addressing the tips and cool stuff found with the goal being that every single one of us, including us, learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include... Mintmobile.com slash MGG, a new one at simplysafe.com slash MacGeekGab. Yeah, it's not an MGG one. It's a MacGeekGab one. I don't know why they did that, but anyway, it's a good place to go. Uh, BB Edit from Barebones.com and Linode.com slash MGG. We'll talk about why you have already gone to those URLs, right? Because you've already gone there because that's that's all. That's our job is to get you to visit our sponsors and learn more there from that point forward. That's between you and them, whether you buy or download or whatever it is, that's between you and them. Our job is to generate a little interest and in have you visit them. And that actually does help us. Um, so we thank you for that. For now, we'll talk more about those later. For now, though, here in balmy Durham, New Hampshire, back in balmy Durham, New Hampshire, where it's warmer than it was where we were in Las Vegas. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John O'Brien. How are you? How are you? We made it, John. We survived the week of CES. We found a lot of cool stuff, some of which we'll talk about in the episode here. And then, um, and, and, you know, we survived Vegas. In fact, I think we did a fantastic job at, uh, at addressing, covering, and conquering CES. So well, that, I thought that was good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Had some minor travel snafus, but uh, we got through them. What were your travel snafus? Well, you and I both got there later than we were supposed oh, to because yeah. there was like terrible weather somewhere. So they had to delay all these flights. It's true. There was it was um, certainly for me. It was I think ground delays in Boston. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but yeah, I think I was what we were each about two hours behind uh, when we find both finally got there. But, we, you know, we got there. Getting home was was cake for me, which is, you know. I, even better, right? To be able yeah. To so getting there was funny. So my first flight went to Houston, and when I got on it, they're like, uh, "Yeah, we're going to Tennessee instead." It's like, uh, "What?" Uh, because there was weather had to get around, and they didn't have enough. That that particular plane didn't have enough fuel. Gotcha. Oh yeah. <laughs> to I, to make the detour. I've um, had that on cross country flights before, not in a long time, but where you know it's like, "Oh yeah, we're going to stop in you know wherever St. Louis or something." It's like what. This was nonstop. Like, well, yeah, nonstops ish. So, yeah. Yeah. The nice part. So I had a short layover. They they just automatically rebooked the, the, the same flight with a different number. It's like, oh, thank you. Oh, they got you on a, a later flight, you mean? So that you didn't yeah. miss your connection. Got it. Oh, that's good. Well, I missed my connection. They just put I mean. me on the next one. and But they automatically did it. As soon as we sure. landed, I got all these text messages saying, hey, you know, we just did this for you. Yeah. Hey, do you use uh, TripIt? For your um, no. for, oh, dude, dude, trip it is. So there's two apps that I use when I travel. One of them is trip it, which now with uh, Project Catalyst is available as a Mac app, though. You could always have used it on the, on the web, uh, you know, in Safari or whatever your browser is on the Mac. But um, trip it for iOS and especially trip it pro are fantastic uh, for making it essentially what happens is when you get your travel plans, you, you can either manually put them in or you can make it very easy where you just forward your travel plans to plans at tripit.com and it goes through and, uh, parses it most of the time. I would say 95% of the time, certainly with all the major like hotels and air airlines and even concert tickets and all that, it parses the email creates your plans and then you can have that sync with your calendar and all that. But the really cool part with trip it pro is you get these travel alerts where when there's problems, you know, ahead of time there, you know, as soon as it's put into the, 
the FAA system, especially with, with airlines, when there's a delay. And that almost always uh, comes in long before you get your alerts from the airline. So I've had it where uh, there's been a, you know, a delay and I can go get in line at the counter or get on the phone before the airline alerts everybody. And then, boom, I'm, I'm good to go. So uh, trip it, it. And it just really makes organizing everything easier because you just sort of forward all the stuff in. And it it builds your your travel itinerary for you. You don't have to like add it to your calendar manually or track it if something about your flight changes. In fact, it'll even track the price of your flight and look for refunds, uh, discounts, or better seats. It's it's pretty cool. So I highly recommend that. And then the other app that I use, and and I've, well, I'll just tell you, I, I use FlightAware. Uh, I think you have to sign up for an account, but it is free. Um, and then once you've signed up for an account, you can get alerts that truly are sort of directly. I mean, they're not directly from the FAA. They're directly from flight aware, but they, those alerts even come in perhaps split seconds sooner than the trip it ones. And you can really get a feel for where your plane is coming in. Like, like if you're at the airport waiting for a plane, with flight aware, you can see where that equipment is. And if it's in en route, then you can, of course, set an alert for that. So, you know, like, all right, cool. I'm going to go get, you know, a burger at the restaurant because the the my flight's delayed. But, you know, when it has landed and then, you you know, you can sort of guesstimate the timing of what it's going to take to turn the plane around and all that good stuff. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm I, I like to sort of, you know, sweat the details and all that stuff. But I'd like to know when I'm flying where my plane is, because that tells me if my flight's going to be on time or if my connecting flight is going to be on time, if I happen to have to connect or whatever. So TripIt and FlightAware are my two. Um, do you use any any travel apps, John, when you're when you're traveling to uh, to do? All um, that? I think I used Kayak to monitor the price of my flight. Oh, before you bought. Yeah. Yes. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All Other right. than that, and you know, you taught me this. I used to use Travelocity, but the the problem with them, so so they were good for you know shopping for the the best rate. In but, like um, ten years not, ago, yeah, yeah, but not anymore because Correct. now all the airlines have these you know really crummy basic tickets, and the thing is, I want to select my seat, and by right. default, I think most of the cheap flights it finds you can't pick your own seat, and I want to pick my own seat, man. Right. I mean, who I, wants to get stuck in the middle? No, that's right. Yeah, you. Yeah, it's. I. I do. I use Kayak um, when I'm booking flights just to get a feel for what's available from all the different airlines. It doesn't show Southwest, so I always have to look at Southwest site um, separately. But it. But Kayak sort of homogenizes the rest of them. But you're right. It does homogenize down to the lowest priced flight. And that usually includes like, you know, maybe standing room only next to the bathroom or something. That's not quite that bad yet. But um, but oftentimes you don't get a seat. You don't some with some airlines with the lowest price fare. You don't even get a carry on. So um, so you got to you got to check those details. But but yeah, kayak is kayak is good. Kayak is good. But then my advice book directly with whatever airline or airlines you are flying with, because that way. You're in their system when there's a problem like you had, John, they prioritize people that have booked directly with them versus people that have booked through an expediter or something to uh, to get the rebookings and all of that. They take care of you because you're their yep. customer, not, you know, arm's length customer kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah, I, I never had problems with Travelocity. But I mean, you know, after I booked the flight with them, I would go directly to whoever booked with them. It was already in their system. Sure. So I, I never had that problem, but I, I think some people probably had where if your flight this week it you know what you described going out to ces the travelocity customers in my experience would have been um would have been prioritized oh. below those of you that booked oh, directly yeah. with the airline so yeah no it's good it's good cool speaking of ces you know we did have um four amazing sponsors that allowed us to do all that coverage that was amazing no pun intended otherworld computing the <laughs> text expander and carbon copy cloner so um, we've got a link in the show notes about them too. But John, while we were at CES, you know, we we had our our room, our suite together, and we were ah, messing around with something. And yeah, was, and I, I looked at your dock, and I'm like, oh, why do you have your dock there? Oh, right. I have my. I keep my dock on all my Macs. I keep my dock on the left side, and I started doing that because the uh, screens are wider than they are tall. 
And therefore, uh, I figure, well, I've got more real estate left to right than I do top to bottom. And the menu bar is already going to take up some of the top of my screen. I want, you know, browser windows as tall as they possibly can be. So let's move the I, and I like the dock to be there all the time. I don't like the dock hidden, although that's just personal preference. So I shifted the dock over to the left, which you can do in system preferences. Or even if you just right click in the dock, you can choose position on screen left and uh and then so the doc lives over there and you tried that and you're like whoa without the problem with that is of course now the size of your doc is smaller because it is now going you know top to bottom instead of left to right so you have yeah and i got so much stuff in there that yeah it wasn't uh, usable but then you saw something and i explained to you why i did it you're like why do you have facetime there (laughs) yeah um, because FaceTime, if you have, oh, is it continuity, I think, enabled? Um, the FaceTime icon will show you if you've had a missed call while you're away from the computer. Right. I, and I really like that little quick tip so that you've got, you know, those red, those red badges uh, right there in your dock. You don't have to pick up your phone to see if you've missed a call. FaceTime, the app on your Mac will show you, which I think is pretty cool. So, yeah. 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 It's good. It's good. All right. Um, and then listener Rob has our next quick tip because we love quick tips. Uh, Rob says, I just found a great article from Cult of Mac highlighting a brilliant feature in Apple Watch that I never knew until now. And I figure that's what quick tips are all about. When you are using your AirPods and also wearing your Apple Watch, there's an easy way to check the battery of your AirPods. Swipe up from the bottom on your watch to get to the control center. This usually just shows the watch battery. If you tap on this, you have an option to enable power reserve mode. Don't. However, if you're using your AirPods, this screen not only gives you the option, but also shows you the battery life of your AirPods. It even separates it out between the pods and the case. Who knew? Thank you so much, Rob. That's the beauty of the quick tip. The stuff that like, I mean, you're you're. FaceTime thing was perfect, right? Because I looked over your shoulder. I'm like, dude, just get rid of that FaceTime icon. What do you need that in your dock for? And you're like, well, here's why. Like, aha, yes, brilliant idea. So good, good stuff. I like it. Uh, speak, uh, any thoughts on that before we move on? We're still still on Apple Watch mode here. But can you ask, you know who, what the level is? That's a good question. Does, does she understand that? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't want to do it in the middle of the show because I don't want to trigger everything. No, no, else. right, right. Yeah, although, although yeah, she the, is pretty uh, good. But. Yeah, the ones that the the Plantronic ones that I have, that they both when you insert them will tell you the battery level, and also they have an app that shows you the battery sure. level in either percent or time. Yeah, the That's Apple, the AirPods. When you open the case next to your phone, it is supposed to slide up from the bottom and show you the battery life left on both your AirPods and your case. I do not find that this happens consistently enough to yield me the desired result without uh, a ton of frustration. Uh, It does work. Eventually it's better if the AirPods are out of the case. Maybe there's a Bluetooth connection happening there that, that doesn't always happen uh, when they are in the case. But anyway, this might be a better way to do it. Okay, and we have a confirmation. Where did we get the confirmation from, Dave? We got it from our chat room, which is at macgeekgab.com slash stream. And Warren said he just tested it and asking you know who does work. So, yeah, so the thing he said was, what's, what my, my, ba- what's my battery level for AirPods? Perfect. Perfect. Neat. Th- thanks, Warren. Yeah, good stuff. All right, while we're sort of on Apple Watch, I think this is Lewis has something to add. Hey Dave, this is Lewis calling from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, most recent show, 795, you were talking about uh, features with your new Apple Watch 5. Uh, one of my favorite tips, and uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention it, uh, because you, it seems like you went to a lot of pains to describe the icons for individual apps you were talking about. Um, the grid view is really interesting, that honeycomb-like view of apps that the, the iPhone shows or the Apple Watch shows by default is a really interesting display and kind of fun to play with, but it's really difficult to find individual apps in. Uh, if you hold down, press and hold down on that screen on the Honeycomb uh, display of apps, you get a choice between switching between grid view and list view. 
and in list view, uh, apps simply show up in alphabetical order, and it's much easier to find uh, individual apps. Hope this helps. Um, probably knew about it, but uh, no, thanks, Lewis. That's a good one. I um, I always I I like I prefer the list view, and I always forget how to get there on my Apple Watch. So I had not done that yet, but yeah, it's just just push down and and you can set it to list view. And it, you're right. It's way easier in list view to find apps because not only do you have the icon, which may or may not be helpful, but you have the name of the app in there in alphabetical order. So, yeah, very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Good stuff. John, that wasn't the only tip, though, that you uh, showed me at CES while we were sort of geeking out and messing around. Oh, you yeah. You want about we activity were, uh, monitor? Well, we went to the... Uh uh, fashion mall Apple store, I think it is. Uh, and I was playing with the uh, the new 16 inch Pro, which I think is my going to be my next portable. Nice, it's really nice. But yeah. yeah, for Yux, I was looking in the system info and activity monitor, and I just stumbled across this. So this is interesting, Dave. Um, so you have five different views: CPU, memory, energy, disk, and network. We were, and I think the CPU view. Um, I'm mentioning this because actually, if so we went to the CPU view and what you can do is right click on the row that shows the names of the things it's measuring for you. If you right click on that, you're going to get a list of the ones that are enabled and the ones that aren't enabled don't have a check mark next to them. And we noticed that there's one there, Dave. I don't think we've seen. I think it's new for Catalina, maybe not, but it's preventing sleep. Now, the interesting thing is if you go to the energy view, that column is already there. Which kind of makes sense. Oh, right. right. <clears throat> At least yeah, on both of my make, machines. No, that makes sense. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because sure. I could see how that's related to energy. Yes. <laughs> if something's printing, preventing sleep. Of course. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah, they got app nap and what else? But a lot of things that are, you know, related to power consumption. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> Good find, so man. machine's not going to sleep. This will tell you why, hopefully. Hopefully. Well, it'll at least give you a clue. And sometimes a clue is all it takes. So, yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, Listener Todd has a nice little tip. He says, I love Apple Notes, but searching for an item or phrase within a note on my Mac has been a pain as Notes just returns a list of the notes the search phrase appears within, but does not locate the phrase within the note. Today, I decided to double click on one of the notes in the list that in turn opened the note in a new window. Then I hit command F revealing the search field at top of the note. I typed in the same phrase and notes highlighted all of the appearances of that phrase in the note typing command G cycles through them top to bottom and command shift G cycles through them in reverse. Life is good. He says, I have no idea how long that option has been there. I suspect a long time, but glad to have found it. Well, again, this is sort of the point of the quick tip is, those things that, you know, if you don't know about them, you can't use them. So even though they might be easy. So thank you, Todd. That's great. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Um, two more quick tips. The next from Robert, who says, if your photo library can't fit on your internal SSD, instead of using Apple Cloud, Apple's iCloud photo library, another option to consider is Adobe Lightroom CC. Certainly not for everyone, but cheaper than buying a dedicated Mac mini. And there are advantages to using a non Apple Photos solution. Number one, it removes the one to one mapping between Apple IDs and cloud storage. This means you can sign up to two computers with the same Adobe account ID to sync and upload photos to a single Lightroom account, even if the two computers use different Apple IDs. So all those things where, you know, uh, partners want to, uh, share a, a a photos library that they both sync to well with iCloud photos that's not the easiest thing in the world to do so that's a good thing another he says it removes the tight linkage between your precious photo library and Mac OS and iOS operating system and application upgrades nuke and pave or restores of your operating system don't have to do anything with your photos and you don't have to worry about hidden changes to iCloud causing problems or syncing or accessing your photos as it seems to do with every major release. That's true. The flip side is that if something happens to break Lightroom integration, you know, until they release a new version, that too can be a problem. 
Um, he says, if one is a hobbyist or serious photographer, all the tools included with Lightroom avoid buying a suite of a la carte photo editing apps. So although there is a monthly cost, there is that hidden savings of not having to buy other apps or services. And he says the web browser interface of Lightroom is fully functional. Unlike Apple, he says where iCloud features are still very primitive at iCloud.com. In a pinch, you can access and manipulate even your photos from any computer on any platform, as long as it has a decent web browser. Um, and he says cross platform support for your precious library is a very long term insurance policy. A cheap PC can always be deployed to sync down a full local copy of all your photos for archival backup or offsite, but non cloud storage. So, yeah, very cool. Thank you, Robert. It's a that's a good sort of perspective to have on on why Lightroom might make sense for some folks. So thank you for that. Good stuff. Thoughts on that, Mr. Braun, before we move on to our last quick tip from Tony here. Nah, <clears throat> I know some people shook their fist at Adobe for pretty much requiring that you have to use the cloud-based subscription thing, but I, you know, you I save like, some dough. I like subscriptions for software. I, I think it's way better than paying once because subscriptions encourage the developer and reward the developer for continuing to make the product relevant and upgrades and all of that. Whereas if you have to buy you know, a new version every, let's say, 12 to 18 months, developers are intentionally holding back features for mm. to make that upgrade worthwhile. Right. Whereas I would want the feature now and I'm happy to pay now. So I, I think taking that that price and, you know, just sort of amortizing mm. it over over, you know, on a monthly basis or even an annual basis for a subscription. I think it works out well for software. I, I grok why people are resistant to it, not just from the change standpoint, but from that whole, you know, death by a thousand cuts kind of thing. But if it is an app that matters to you, I think subscription is better than one time purchase because you uh, you're hedging your bets towards the longevity of that app. So that's my, that's my, that's my spiel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'd like to have a choice. Sure. But right? it, uh, one or the other, but, but that's I not how it, but uh, that, that doesn't actually work. Right. I mean, if somebody's doing it, think, think about it, right. If somebody's doing a subscription uh, to some of their users and then a, you know, flat rate purchase to others, you've now got two sets of customers that are going to be using the, your same app with two different sets of features. Cause you're necessarily going to hold, you're going to give features to the subscription people as soon as you're finished writing and testing them. Whereas you're going to hold back features from the folks that are paying a flat rate, you know, mm. uh, so that that's, I don't know if that's actually sustainable. I don't, I don't yeah. think you get, no, I, I get the, yeah. uh, yeah, I get that the revenue comes in fits and spurts. If you know, you're, yeah. you're doing the self direct, whereas, you know, uh, I think most businesses like to have uh, a steady stream of revenue right. versus, um, right. and income versus a chaotic one. Right. Um, right. Right. Yeah. No, it's right. good. That's good. Uh, all right. Last quick tip. Tony uh, says, uh, Dave and John, and for those that use keyboard and maestro, I have a cool macro that I found on the keyboard and maestro forms. We'll link to it. The name of it is move mouse to frontmost window when window changes. This is especially helpful if you use multiple monitors with your Mac and switch among them a lot while switching apps. If you move your cursor to the active window slash application, but only use the application switcher shortcut. So command tab to change apps. Uh, this is very helpful that if you switch apps from screen one over to screen three, for example, you won't also have to move the mouse over manually to interact with the app on screen three. It just jumps the mouse for you. That's what this macro does. It saves a lot of mouse movement. Once you switch to the new app, your mouse cursor is already there waiting for you to interact. The macro allows you to customize where you would like to have the cursor placed in relation to the app that you have just switched to. He says, I use the toggle that remembers the last position used for that particular app. And it's really quite useful. So thanks for that. That's um, that's yeah, I've got a, I have not uh, installed this yet, but, but I will. That's, that's pretty good. I like it. I like it. I like it. Coolio. All right. Thank you, Tony. Um, what I want to do now, Mr. Braun, if it's okay with you, is to talk about our first two sponsors. Sure. 
All right. Our next sponsor is Simply Save Home Security because Simply Save is like getting commercial grade enterprise level security, but for your own home. Think about the security that Fortune 500 companies use. They need to know police are going to be on the scene immediately. And this is exactly the kind of security you get with Simply Safe. If there's a break in, Simply Safe uses real video evidence to give police an eyewitness account of the crime. And that means police dispatch up to 350% faster than for a normal burglar alarm. You get comprehensive protection for your home, outdoor cameras and doorbells to alert you to anyone approaching, entry motion, and glass break sensors. Plus, Simply Safe protects your home from fires, water damage, and carbon monoxide poisoning. And it's all monitored 24 7 by live security professionals. But here's the thing you can set up your own system if you like. And we Mac Geek uh, people are but into that because we like to do our own stuff. That's what we learn about here. There are no wires to install and there are no long-term contracts, right? It's only 50 cents a day and you can start and stop whenever you like. So here's a cool thing. If you go to simplysafe.com slash Mac geek gab. Yeah, that's a little different than the one we usually use. So make sure simplysafe.com slash MacGeekGab today to get free shipping on your order plus a 60-day money-back guarantee. So you get to test this out for 60 days and then you can get your money back if you don't like it. That's simplysafe.com slash MacGeekGab to save on home security today. Our thanks to Simply Safe for sponsoring this episode. All right, next up, Mint Mobile. Listen, it's 2020. If you're still using one of the big wireless providers this year, have you asked yourself what you're paying for? They've got their expensive retail stores, inflated prices, and hidden fees. You're probably being taken advantage of because they know you'll pay. And this is why Mint Mobile can exist. Because Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage that you're used to at a fraction of the cost because everything is online. Mint Mobile saves on all that overhead of retail stores and all that stuff, and then they pass those savings directly along to you. This is like the thing of the future, right? We were just in Las Vegas for CES. Mint Mobile's coverage was perfect the whole way. Everywhere that I needed coverage, I had coverage with my Mint Mobile plans. And they make, speaking of plans, they make it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month because every plan comes with unlimited nationwide text and talk. And with Mint Mobile, you get to stop paying for, you know, quote unquote, unlimited data that you never use. No one uses unlimited, right? You use a certain amount. So why not just pay for a certain amount? And with Mint Mobile, you can choose between plans that have three, eight or 12 gigs of 4G LTE data you bring your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. You keep your same phone number, of course, all your existing contacts and all that stuff. iPhone features like visual voicemail and all that stuff work great with Mint Mobile. So you can ditch your old wireless bill and start saving with Mint Mobile today. So to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash MGG. You got it. That's Mint Mobile, M-I-N-T-M-O-B-I-L-E dot com slash M-G-G. And you can cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month. Again, it's mintmobile.com slash M-G-G. And our thanks to Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode. All right, let's go to Joe. Joe BP, as it were. He says, as a legacy user of old iPod tech, from the clip-on shuffle to the classic, I got tired of trying to load stuff on my shuffle since Apple saw to it to get rid of iTunes. I've not been able to see anything that is on there from what used to be a five-minute task of adding music turned into a nightmare. Google Foo didn't help. Apple was useless. And even the forums were no help. The only thing that came close to working was reformatting for disk use and loading on manually. So I broke down and I bought a little clip player on Amazon a SanDisk Clip Sport, easy to load, and I can see all that I have on there. So that's his contribution for Cool Stuff Found this week is the SanDisk Clip Sport. It, it, you know, it's what it's a, a what's the price on this thing? Uh, 
uh, okay, 50 see. bucks. Yeah, 50 bucks. So, yeah, interesting. And and the cool part is this will play MP3, AAC, Audible, FLAC, Obvor, Ogvorbis, WAV files, WMA files. So it's got good compatibility with things, um, perhaps even uh, not perhaps a lot more than you might have been able to get away with with the uh, with with an old shuffle. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, OK. Like it. Yeah. And it, uh, yeah, I'm looking here. So an iPod touch starts at one ninety nine. So you uh, you save some bucks there. Depending yeah, on your big needs. Time. yeah. Depending on your needs. Yeah. Yeah. Fair point. Yeah. 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 That's good. All right. Um, speaking of old Apple devices and what to do with them, Chris shares, uh, he says, um, I thought you might be interested. I'd been looking for a high quality digital photo frame, but not been able to find one. Then I tried to trade in an old iPad and realized that this was not worth much. And then it hit me. I looked on Amazon for iPad digital photo frame and found the iframe that turns your iPad into a beautiful interactive digital picture frame. It's a picture frame, essentially, that fits on your iPad. And he says, I would recommend this to anyone with an old but working iPad with a screen in good condition. It comes with a range of mounts to accommodate different iPad sizes and allows access to the power button and has a, uh, a route for the power cable. The screens on all iPads are uh, of comparable or better quality to what is available with purpose made digital frames, uh, which generally seem to be made to a price. Uh, he says, I've created a photos folder for the pictures that we want to display and both my wife and I can uh, add to it. And then all the pictures uh, come on the slideshow. He says, the only thing that is missing, and this could be a geek challenge, is the ability to add to the slideshow remotely. In other words, he says, I can add to the photos folder remotely, but I have to access the iPad to add them to the slideshow. What would be the icing on the cake would be the ability to do this remotely, say from Hong Kong. Uh, some of the purpose made digital photo frames do offer this, but it does not seem to be available from within photos. So, yeah, off the top of my head, and I've been thinking about this since we prepped this, you know, late last week. I'm not sure of how to add to a slideshow, because even as he points out, even if you add them to an album, it doesn't change the slideshow. So I wonder if there's like if there's another app to use, right? Because apps can read from photos libraries. So maybe there is a slideshow app that that will update for itself from a library to to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Any thoughts on that, John? Mm, not yet. OK. All right. <laughs> That's. We will we will see where that gets. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we use I will add my own cool stuff found here. And, and that is we use something called the Skylight Frame here at home. Um, they they've never sponsored this show, but they've sponsored other podcasts before, which is, you know, how I found out about it. But man, I mean, perfect for for this audience. In fact, I'm kind of surprised they haven't. But uh, the Skylight Frame, you hang it on your wall and uh and it connects to your Wi-Fi, right? And so you have an email address. You can, I think, you can load things on with a with a USB cable if you want. But uh, it's got you know its own memory on there, and there's an email address that you can just send to. Uh, and you can, you know, you, it, it, a it's sort of a you know security by obscurity address that no one would be able to guess. But b, I think you can sort of limit who gets to send to it if you want. But it's great. Yeah, because we just email photos to an address and then, you know, at home we have this frame. It's just hanging in our kitchen, but it's awesome. You know, all the little family events that we do, we just blast stuff, uh, you know, sometimes even, you know, like if we're at a concert or something on set break, well, I'll send a couple of pictures that I took to the frame. I mean, that way, even by the time we get home, you know, certainly there they are. And it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. So it, it's kind of this this rotating thing that. uh it's cool. So I totally grok why Chris wants to do what Chris wants to do. And if there's an app for the iPhone that does this, that would be uh, stellar. I so I think I got it. All right. right. Good. What is it? What if you make your <clears throat> what if you make what if you put the photos that you want to display in your iCloud drive? Those okay. are shared between multiple devices, right? So you want to add some more photos? You just 
Well, no, so, you so need the, an question, app. the question is how to get them added to the existing slideshow that's happening. Because, I mean, if they're added to your iCloud photo library or even a shared album that, say, your aunt, your family has, like, that's easy. But in order to get the iOS photos app slideshow to show those new photos, you have to sort of go and say, make a slideshow with with this album right. as it exists. Well, what today. I'm proposing is using something other than that to display the photos. So there has to be a, I mean, somebody has to make a slideshow app. Right. That's yeah. Well, that's sort of what I was but, saying. But my thought is to have a shared cloud folder and that will be how you would add new photos while it's still running. Right. But how do you add them to the slideshow? Uh, so you have a shared folder. Okay. And the, uh, the app that you're using points to that folder that has photos in it. Right, but but what app are you using? Like what? Well, I don't know yet. Okay, so that but that's the question. I need like a slideshow app. I don't correct. Think, uh, photos will do it. Well, photos will do a slideshow, and photos also yeah. with iCloud Photo Library will do all the syncing. So you don't need to worry about the iCloud mm-hmm. Drive thing. Like the photos are already there. the 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 trick is how do you tell the iPad to automatically include new photos added to album A to the already running slideshow that's the that's the trick and it seems like at least the way chris is doing it there is no um there is no way to do that so so that's the that's the trick yeah well if anybody knows we'll just treat it as a geek challenge that's a good one that's a good one all right any more thoughts huh yeah no i'm looking here it looks like if you make an album yeah. Yeah, but you once you start a slideshow from an album, I don't think it pulls in things that have been newly added to that album oh. via iCloud. That's what oh. we keep saying here. Yeah. I, I was hoping it would, but yeah, right. Yeah. Right. It doesn't. That's right. Bummer. Right. Yeah. I'll but, have to poke around. Yeah. See if there's another app that, Agreed. that would handle this. I'm a big fan of Busy Cal, John, because um because it it's a in my opinion a better calendar than uh than apple's calendar it's just a little more full featured but in ios 13 and in mac os catalina apple made a change to it the way reminders are stored previously reminders were visible uh via uh the caldav sync protocol and if you do the reminders upgrade, so you don't have to, um, but once you do it, you can't go back. But, uh, you know, when you launch reminders on on Mac OS or, or iCloud or I, sorry, iOS or iPad OS, uh, it will offer to convert to the new format, which adds some features and like not a bad thing. But what it does is it takes that away from the iCloud sync. Uh, oh, sorry, not the iCloud sync, the CalDAV sync, which is what's available to third parties. And so if you were like me and you were or are a busy Cal or I don't know if it how it affects other calendar apps. So I don't want to say the names of them, but um, but certainly with busy Cal on both Mac OS and iOS, you it, you couldn't convert if you wanted to manage your reminders in uh, those apps. Well, now you can, because as of. Busy Cal 3.8 on macOS Catalina and 3.5.2 on iOS, they've added the ability to do what they call reminders sync. So it will sync your calendars with CalDAV like it always has, as it should. But your reminders, you can now also sync locally with the copy that's on the device. So iCloud does the syncing, brings it to your device. And then BusyCal just sort of peeks into that and can can read and write from it so you can actually manipulate the library and, and all that, which is great. That's that's the that is the workaround. So good stuff. And um, I like it. So I'm glad now I can finally do my reminders upgrade. I haven't done it yet, but now I know I can. So thanks to Fahad and the team over there at uh, BusyCal that are making that possible for us. Good stuff. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Richard has a cool stuff found for us. He says, uh, you know, you guys have been talking about different ways to rename files. And certainly that was true in 795. 
which is the last uh, pre the last non interview uh, slash guest episode that that we did. He says one that I like is called Renamer at Renamer dot com says I really like the layout of making recipes or renamerlets as they call them to rename files. It has saved me a ton of time so you can have it sort of automatically rename some files if you're downloading things like say bank statements or things like that where it just automatically renames them and and off it goes. So thank you for that, Richard. Good stuff. We will, of course, as always, put a link in the show notes. You can see the show notes at MacGeekGab.com, but you can also have them delivered to your inbox so that you never miss out and you've always got a copy of them where you can click on the links and see all the stuff that we talked about, all that good stuff. Go to MacGeekGab.com, put in your email address there, and uh, and we'll send you the show notes every week when, when they're ready, So when the show comes out, which is sort of the same. So, Yeah, good stuff, John? Yes. Cool. So we were at CES last week, as we mentioned, and we saw lots of things. We've published a lot of a lot of pieces and videos and all sorts of things uh, that we saw. And I, I don't know if you have any more in the queue as of the moment that we're recording the show, but I certainly do. So there'll be more going up um, probably throughout the day on Monday as well. Uh, and there might be some still going up this weekend. I've, I've been sort of processing when I can. But um, one thing that I haven't talked about yet is Wi-Fi. And there was a lot of Wi-Fi uh, happening and evolving, or we're seeing the evolution of Wi-Fi through a lot of products that uh, that were that were shown uh, both on the you know at the various events, but also sort of in private meetings and things like that at CES. And there's two sort of main pushes that I'm seeing from lots of different vendors. So meeting with companies like Netgear and D-Link and TP-Link, uh, Wi-Fi six is in full force. And so Wi-Fi 6 operates over the 5 gigahertz band, same as Wi-Fi 5, but it will also operate over a 6 gigahertz band. And um, and while very few of our Apple devices, our iPhones 11 are the only current Apple devices that support Wi-Fi 6, right? It's weird that the MacBook Pro 16 didn't, doesn't have a Wi-Fi 6 chip in it, but, you know, whatever, that's fine. Um, it, I'm sure they will where Wi-Fi six is immediately of interest is in a mesh scenario because what Wi-Fi six can do, even if you don't have any devices that support it, your mesh system can still use Wi-Fi six for itself. And for example, with the TP link, their X 96 has Wi-Fi six E, which is the thing that uses six gigahertz. And the nice part about that is that's not a congested band right now. So you get that backhaul that's way faster than potentially way faster than Ethernet, than gigabit Ethernet happening with, uh, you know, amongst your mesh Wi-Fi, further alleviating the need to, you know, consider running cables or using something like Mocha to, you know, approximate a, uh, or to leverage the coax cables that you have in your walls and things like that. So these these Wi-Fi 6 mesh systems are are very interesting and very relevant right out of the gate. Now, a year, maybe certainly two years from now, but probably less, uh, we'll see a lot more devices that use Wi-Fi 6. And even, you know, even with your iPhones using it, the nice part about that is, you know, Wi-Fi 6 is more efficient. It, it, it uses a better signaling algorithm like Doxis 3.1. I think it's the same OFDMA, but it's some, if it's not, it's something very similar to that, where it's way more efficient at sending data across, which, of course, therefore oh, yeah, makes it look at faster. I thought, you, I thought you misspoke when you said 6 gigahertz, but I'm now looking at an a article about it. And yeah. yeah, the other thing is the channels are bigger. So they have 80 megahertz and also... 160 megahertz channels. Huh. Well, you can do 160 with Wi Fi 5. Oh, can you? Yeah, oh, but okay. but it's like, I mean, so very rarely is the environment such that it actually works and stays at 160. Most of the time it's dropping down to 80 at best. Whereas with Wi Fi 6, you're it's a it's a lot more robust. As I said, the signaling algorithm is is way better uh at this. And also um, the whole multi-user MIMO, the Moo MIMO thing where multiple devices can talk simultaneous, truly talk simultaneously is 
a part of the core standard with Wi-Fi 6. So you get that not only on your 5 gigahertz or maybe even 6 gigahertz channels, but you also get it on your 2.4, right? Because because of the way Wi-Fi 6 works. Yeah. Oh, and look at, okay, so I actually, it seems that even my first gen Eero is talking 80 megahertz, depending on. Depending on your environment. That's thing. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know uh, if the Eero will do 160, if it'll even try it. Uh, it might. It might. It, it happens so infrequently in like real world scenarios that it it's just not, you know, it's just not how it goes. And there's a lot of different options coming out. One thing that that I'm very excited about comes from Netgear uh, because Netgear's thus far, Netgear's Wi-Fi mesh offering has been the Orbi, right? And the Orbi, when it started life, was not really mesh. It was star configuration, meaning the satellite units, when talking back to the router, had to talk directly back to the router. There was no multi-hop. So if, let's say, you have a long house and your router, by definition of where your internet access is, comes into one point, uh, if you want to have a satellite unit at, you know, the far other end of your long but rectangular house, that satellite unit way over there has to talk directly back. It cannot it could not hop via one, say, in the middle. Uh, so they changed that. And they also added the ability for us to do Ethernet backhaul, which was not part of the Netgear Orbi out of the box. What was part of the Netgear Orbi out of the box and still very much is is their backhaul used uh, four by four Wi-Fi uh, radio streams and was like the fastest backhaul that you could get. So depending on the right environment, you know, Netgear's Orbi would, would could be perfect for you, but it did not have that flexibility out of the box. And when they added multi hop and when they added um, uh, Ethernet backhaul, you know, it wasn't a core part of the firmware, so it was sort of a bolt on thing and it felt like it and it was clunky. It's gotten way better. They keep updating the firmware and and they're getting there in, in a lot of cases. They've gotten there. Right. Which is great. And so so it, it has matured. However. When I talk to them about it, they're like, well, you know, Orbi is built for the sort of casual user, the people that don't want to tweak things. And so the whole idea of Ethernet backhaul, that's that's a more advanced feature. We might argue that point, but that's sort of the way they look at it. And and certainly the idea of multi hop, they say that's a more advanced feature. Again, we might argue that, but that's how they look at it. However, they have a new Nighthawk mesh system, the MK63, that is for their Nighthawk line has has is the name that they assign to their you know, more, more uh, geek focused or gamer sometimes focused routers. Right. And so this has a little more features in, in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the, in the software there and a uh, little more granular controls. Uh, and so this Nighthawk mesh is very interesting to me because maybe this is what we want to see. Now it's not out yet. We're very much looking forward to testing it when it does uh, come out. They, you can pre-order on Amazon now, I believe, and they say it'll ship before the end of January. So we're close on this. It's not, um, it's not out, but I don't, I wouldn't call it vaporware. Let's, you know, let's, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's coming. So um, I'm excited about, about that. Uh, so we'll, we'll check that out. And I've got a, a video coming up so you can see some of that stuff on, uh, on Mac observer. So that's, um, that's Netgear. I mentioned TP link. They, like I said, they've got several different options and, you know, TP links deco line has been the sort of low cost, um, and yet fully functional mesh Wi-Fi system, but it was always missing WAN based QoS to protect against that buffer bloat, right? That we've talked about here. They say that it is now available. Uh, WAN based QoS is available in all of their Wi Fi 6 decos. And they are looking at bringing it to via software update to existing ones pre Wi Fi 6, which is good to see. So they've got some tri band ones, they've got some dual band ones. Uh, really, it, it depends on your you know on your environment. But the one that I've linked in the show notes here, the Deco X96. That's the one that uses um, 6E with the 6 gigahertz for, um, you know, for the backhaul. So that would be that would be a good thing. 
Uh, so we'll we'll you know we'll we'll check that out and see where it where it comes. And then um, and then uh, where is the other one? D Link, right? So D Link's doing taking an interesting approach here. Everything that D Link makes now, all of their current crop of routers and all of their sort of all their mesh systems support what they call D Link mesh, which means you can buy that you know, super hoopty uh, router that has all the configuration stuff and then add some D-Link access points and it all will mesh together. So you can sort of build your own mesh using different parts. You're not stuck with just like, here's this mesh system that's separate from our routers. No, they all speak what they call D-Link mesh. It's similar to what Asus uh, is and has been doing Although Asus's stuff has been a little weird on the mesh side, at least based on my testing. So but there's a reason we don't recommend it a lot here on the show. I right? don't even talk about it here a lot on the show. But, um, well, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? That whole Lyra thing from, from Asus was a disaster. But, um, but this whole, this D-Link mesh thing with, uh, w- you know, with their Wi-Fi 6 stuff, I like it. Um, and, you know, the, their prices are... Are, are good. The prices on all this stuff are good. In fact, the the, the Netgear um, Nighthawk mesh system, a two pack is only two twenty nine, right? So like these things are are in the right realm. So this concept of the D Link mesh, John, is not the only mesh interoperability conversation that I've had though, because both TP Link and Netgear are supporting Easy Mesh, which is a standard for mesh interoperability across vendors. So just like with Wi-Fi, right? Like you don't have to have an Apple Wi-Fi access point to use your iPhone with Wi-Fi, but with mesh up until now you do, right? You need all your mesh stuff to come from the same vendor. Your iPhones and other devices can connect to it, but in terms of your router and mesh hardware, it all needs to come from the same place. That is, may not be true for you in the future um, with easy mesh because easy mesh is this standard that um, that Netgear and uh, and uh, and TP link are, are doing D link says they may bake this into their stuff in the future. There are other vendors using it as well, but um, it allows for you to buy say a, you know, Netgear or a TP link, you know, router uh, or and and or Netgear router and then a TP link or Netgear. Like it doesn't matter whose access points you buy, buy the ones that are of interest and the right form factor and have the right um, physical capabilities uh, and features that you want. And then you can add them via easy mesh. Now, will most people do that? Probably not. Should most people do that? My advice currently, probably not. And the reason is easy mesh doesn't cover every feature. Easy mesh covers connecting to the mesh, sharing the same SSID, the network name and encryption slash password, and also the meshing slash routing features. But easy mesh doesn't share parental controls. It doesn't share any of those sort of more advanced things across the mesh. Now, if your router is taking care of all that, great. But if you're running a mesh where the router is expecting the access points to, say, deny devices from connecting based on the way parental controls work from that vendor, then easy mesh starts to get to be a little bit wonky. So I would say this is a nice thing to see from an industry standpoint. I would not necessarily base, I would not make any purchases based on this. I might base my next purchase on this in that it would be nice to have the flexibility of easy mesh in the next, you know, thing that you get, but I wouldn't count on it, but I would just say, Oh, it's, it's a nice insurance policy. I'll have easy mesh in this. That way, you know, if anything happens, I've still got an easy mesh compatible system. I can add other things to it, even if the original vendor stops making the things I want or whatever. So I would look at it right now as an insurance policy for us as consumers, not as the thing that we uh, start using it right away, if that makes sense. Thoughts on that, John? Now, looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, um, uh, what did you what did did you notice any any trends or any specific things, John, at CES that you want to tell us about? Um, 
Yeah, what a few things caught my eye. Um Yes. Environmental sensors. Oh. Yeah, I found one company that make a, it's, it's kind of cool. It's a, I think it's a French company, but yeah. um so they make this cool little thing that has um I think it's like six different sensors. So measure air quality, uh UV light, um Let's see. Yeah. UV light, volatile organic compounds or pollution, both in indoors and outdoors. Yep. I never thought I needed something like this before, but you, you never know. <laughs> um, that was neat. Some health stuff. So uh, Withings released a watch that not only does an ECG, but it also does uh, sleep apnea. It'll detect um, oxygen levels and tell you if you have uh, sleep apnea. Okay. That's kind of neat. So, That's you know, cool. other other people entering that arena. Yep. Um, I saw some neat pet things. Um, you you may want to try this one out here, but there's one company that made a smart cat feeder. <laughs> okay. So, um, and they actually have an entire system. So not only is it a feeder, but they also make a door. Uh, so you you need to chip your cat. Um, I don't know if cats are into that. Do you do you chip your cats or oh, dogs yeah. or? Yeah, we chip okay, them great. both. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so so the the uh, so the door and this device and and they have one other, um, yeah, will kind of you know give you a you know summary of you know your pet's health. You know, it's like how how much is how much is your cat you know going inside and out? I mean, is it sitting around all day just you know eating or is it actually getting activity? So, right, right. So the the pet related stuff was neat. Huh. Um, what else did I see? Yeah, another health thing. The the there was a company not selling direct to consumers, but it was like a health vest. So it has like all these sensors in it. It's like a t-shirt. Yeah. And it measures your uh, you know, your heart rate, you know, like six different parameters, and then it'll upload it to uh your coach or your doctor or something like that. So um huh. it's a lot of health stuff. Um Oh yeah, Finn. Th this was a neat one. So, uh, so you know, they have all the. Th I, I thought this was amazingly clever. So, uh, they have a lot of these devices now that'll tell you about the water in your house. Right. Right. This one kind of caught my eye because you don't need a plumber to install it. Now, some uh, most of the ones that are like at the start of your water line, um, you you need a plumber to do that. You can't do it yourself. This new device, though, though it doesn't have a shut off in it, um, it will tell you, and you install it at any one of your sinks. And then what it does is it uses like little variations in pressure. I think two hundred and forty per second, and it'll kind of figure out what things in your house are using water. It, it's kind of weird. Wow. I guess there's a lot of science behind this. Huh. So it'll know that you have a sink here and a shower here and, and, and things like that. And then tell you, if, you know, what's up, you know, if it's leaking or freezing or, or, or things like that. That's crazy. Wow. Huh? Yeah. A little bit of everything. I, I, I like to find the, uh, you know, kind of offbeat stuff. Sure. Yeah, of course. And of course. And of course, you know, check out our, uh, if you go to MacObserver.com, you'll see CES 2020 and there's, uh, all the stuff that our team, uh, uh, Noted. All together, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That's great, man. I like it. Yeah, there's lots more that I'm sure will come out. I mean, we've I've certainly seen more things than we've talked about both on the site and here. So, yeah. But that's that's sort of the beauty of CES is. And we try to filter through it all to find the things that either do exist or we're fairly confident will exist. Occasionally, we choose to cover something that we're not sure about its existence just because the concept is cool, but we try to, I, we try to, you know, articulate that for you, but yeah, there you go. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. All right, Mr. Braun, we have some questions to answer. And, um, the first thing I want to do though, is talk about our next two sponsors, if that's okay for you. Okay. All right. Our next sponsor is Linode at L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash M-G-G, where you get a $20 credit to get started with this great hosting company, right? Because you need a server for something in your life. I mean, if you're listening to this show, chances are 
You might have already had one in the past or you're definitely going to have one in the future. It's just how it works. Well, Linode knows how to make fast servers and do it at a great price because they understand that native SSD storage, right? Like we use on our Macs. Ma Remember how fast your Mac got when you finally moved to an SSD? Well, every Linode server uses SSDs. And that way, even the lowest priced Nanode server at $5 a month, which has sort of limited CPU and RAM, as you might understand, is still running on an SSD. And that way, you're still getting all that speed of the SSD. You can pick from any of their 10 worldwide data centers. You can either pay for what you use or for the whole month. Like I said, with the Nanode server, it's five bucks. Of course, you can scale up if you need more CPU or RAM. But they've got all that for you. And if you want to use the terminal, you can, but you don't have to because their new cloud manager makes it super easy to just get in there and set up a server without ever touching the command line. They've got all these sort of pre-built things. If you want a VPN, you want a WordPress server, you want a Minecraft server, they're all right there. So go check it out and get your $20 credit at linode.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. Next up. BB Edit from barebones.com. You need a text editor in your life. I, I know that sounds crazy to say. I, I never have my computer running without BB Edit. I mean, maybe for five minutes and then it's like, oh, right, BB Edit's not running. I got to get it running because I use it for so many things. Sure, I use it for coding and stuff. Me, I use it for a lot of PHP and HTML stuff because we publish for the web. So that's sort of where my, my days are, at least in terms of programming. But you can program in pretty much any language. And the cool part is for that, BB Edit recognizes what language you're in and starts doing this very subtle but very helpful highlighting of your code. It doesn't change your code on disk or anywhere else. Just on the screen does this little kind of subtle highlighting to let you see where you are in your code. In fact, it even recognizes functions and formulas and all that and you can twist them close and open so you, you can really start to get a feel for all of that and certainly that's helpful but even if you never do any programming bb edit can be your best friend because it can help you count words in a text document it can help you compare two text documents which is huge it can help you simply by nature of it being only a text editor. If you've got some text that's sort of got weird formatting or whatever, paste it into BB Edit and it's gone. The formatting is, not, not the text, because they just strip it out by nature of them only supporting text. Very, very cool stuff. I use it all the time. You will use it too. And here's the thing. You can go get the 30-day trial for free of every feature. After 30 days, BB Edit reverts to free mode unless... You pay for it, which you might want to, but you might also find that the free mode works perfectly for you. So go check it out. You got nothing to lose. Barebones.com for BB Edit and our thanks to Barebones for making BB Edit and for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, we got an interesting question from Russell, um, I don't know, about a week and a half ago before we left for CES. And while we were at CES, we had the opportunity to do some testing to potentially answer this question. So Russell wrote, he says, my iPhone 11 pro connected to my Mac mini pulled enough power that the Mac mini shut down the USB bus. The battery swelled in my daughter. So that's his short summary. Now the sort of longer story, which is, which is important. He says, uh, started when the battery swelled in my daughter's iPhone 10. So I was on my way to the genius bar to see what we could resolve. I used iMazing to back up the phone and then restored that to an old 6S Plus that I've kept as a spare. Uh, he says it was going to be about $550 uh, US dollars for an out-of-warranty repair on the iPhone 10, and she's been wanting a new phone anyway, so we traded in the broken phone for an iPhone 11 Pro on a day with 6% cash back using Apple Pay on the Apple Card, so that's good. Uh, he says it got interesting when I tried to use iMazing to restore her backup to the new phone. The Mac mini displayed a message that the USB device was pulling too much power and shut off the USB ports on the Mac mini. 
This, of course, corrupted the phone. So it got the icons about plugging in a cable and restoring factory default. So it went into restore mode or whatever that is. Uh, he says, I tried this several times. I spent an hour on the phone with Apple support. With the net result being that I had to take it back to the Apple store for them to restore the base image. I was shocked when they pulled out a MacBook Air running on battery, connected a USB cable to the phone and did a simple iTunes process to restore the phone. My theory which I was unwilling to test because I wasn't going to fix a working phone until it was broken again. That's smart. He says, is that using the USB-C to lightning cable, the phone was pulling power like it was connected to its charger, which is more than the Mac mini is designed to furnish to its USB ports. When it was connected to the MacBook Air via a USB-A cable, it pulled a more restrained power level. He says, I think it might have been able to do the re- I think I might have been able to do the restore if I'd used one of the Mac mini USB a ports. He says, I was also thinking about using the camera connection kit dongle that you guys have discussed. I could have plugged the phone charger into the lightning port to power the phone and use the USB connection to get the data signal, et cetera, et cetera. He says, I finally moved your data to the new iPhone in the simplest way. Take a picture of the little blue circle to pair the phones to each other and leave them next to each other for a while to let them do the transfer themselves. So, yeah, that is a good way to do it. But this did get us thinking. And so we tested this because I brought some USB A and USB C power meters uh, with us to CES. And one night we sat in the room and went through all this. So uh, using my I was using my iPad, I believe, to test this just to see truly how much and it was a low charged iPad because the amount of power that it will draw is um, inversely related to how much of a charge uh, it what the where the battery percentage is on the phone. So the lower the battery percentage on the device, the more power it will slurp through as it gets closer and closer. It starts pulling less power so that you don't overheat the battery and blow things up or, you know, cause damage and it wouldn't necessarily blow it up, but it could. Uh, so. Doing this testing, we saw some interesting things, John. On USB-A um, with uh, direct power, we were getting, uh, let's see, 2.2 amps at 5 volts. So essentially 10 watts, right, John, if, the, if, the math, if my math is right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and then using a USB hub... Uh, we were only getting one amp at five volts. So the hub was sort of dumbing things down. This is all over USB a to So one amp at five volts would be five Watts. So, okay. USB a, the most that we could get this thing to draw was, um, was 10 Watts of power. And depending on how you connected it, either five Watts or 10 Watts, which makes sense. That's what we've seen over the years. That's normal USB. a. Okay. Now, USB-C to lightning, things got very interesting going direct. And when I say direct power, I mean direct from the uh, from like a a charger on the wall. And then and then the other was a USB hub connect a USB uh, a hub connected because I had my my MacBook, uh, my my 2018 MacBook Air, which doesn't have a USB a port. So I was using various different uh, USB hubs. So direct power over USB-C. uh we were able to get again, and this is using a USB C to lightning cable. So with direct power from a power delivery charger, uh, we got two amps, but at 14 and a half volts. So, you know, 29 Watts, 30 Watts. So that's significantly more than 10 Watts that we were getting, uh, from direct power with USB a, but from the laptop, what we drew was 2.3 amps at five volts. So 10 Watts ish, but that's double what we were pulling with USB a from the laptop. So it's entirely possible. I've not tested this on the Mac mini because we didn't have a Mac mini with us, but, um, but it's entirely possible that pulling 10 Watts of power out of the USB ports on your Mac mini, especially sustained, while you were connected and, and, you know, trying to transfer data and do all that stuff might be more, you, there might be, your theory might hold water, Russell, but um, yeah, which is interesting. It's great having these little, these little um, power meters, USB power meters, because you can just see all this stuff in, in real time. But yeah, 10 Watts, I, we could not get 
the, any device to pull more than five watts uh, using USB A from the MacBook. Uh, but we definitely could obviously get it to pull 10 watts when using USB C direct. So I don't know. What do you think, John? I like USB C. Oh, yeah. I like USB C power delivery. I was, I was testing this at some point with my phone to see which method of charging the iPhone eight is the quickest and mm-hmm. the quickest. I think in many cases or all, all cases is USB C with power delivery. Right. So we would call it, it that that's what I was calling direct here. So direct to a charger yeah. on the wall that, that supports PD. Right. And, and most, well, most USB C chargers support power delivery. Um, but, but not all, there are some that don't, and, and they support it at different levels. There's a lot of them that support it only at like 18 Watts, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to, you know, there's some that'll go up to, but just shy of a hundred Well, they'll do a hundred, but the, the MacBook pro only takes it at like 98 or something like that because of the battery size. But yeah. Yeah. I think the order I got was USB C was the fastest, mm-hmm. then USB a, okay. and then G. Right. And whatever numbers you get on these, um, you know, on these little uh, power meters, the inline Mm -hmm. USB power meters that we get, I think with Qi, basically, I was talking to some people at CES to confirm this, but basically it's that you'll lose 50 percent of that to the to heat in the process of getting the power over the Qi coil. So, yeah, whatever you measured being pulled with with uh, with Qi half of that is about what's going to your phone. So, right. Right. Yeah. Which is, cause I think fast charge with the iPhone is seven Watts, I think. Right. Uh, seven and a half. Yeah. Yeah. For, for fast. Supposedly yeah. fast. Were you, were you ever able to see like, you know, 10 plus or, or 15 on a, on a fast charge Qi charger? being pulled because if we're using the 50% number, that's what it would, that's what it would take. Right. So, right. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. No. And I forget what I got, but when I did the power delivery, I think it was like over 10 Watts. It was like 20 Watts or something. I don't know. Yeah. I'll try it again. It Well, it depends on your, the, the device that you're charging this, the charge state of that device, as we said, the lower, the more juice it needs, the more it will pull. Right. Because I like I noticed, you know, this thing was pulling 30 watts when we started the the iPad Pro that I was that I was testing with was pulling 30 watts when we started. But, you know, I mean, it's pulling a lot of power and so it's charging the battery quickly. And we started with it at maybe 12 percent of of the battery. I'd intentionally let it get low for these tests. But by the time it got up to 50 percent, it was only pulling maybe, you know, 20 watts of power. So your iPhone, I don't think. I, I haven't tested, but I, I don't think the iPhone will ever pull. I don't think it would ever pull 30. Um, even the right. charging brick that comes with the uh, USB-C based iPad Pros, the current crop of iPad Pros is only an 18 watt charger if, if memory serves. So they're not even trying to give you more than that, which is which is interesting. So, yeah, I love this stuff. I love getting geeky because it, you know, it's what we do. Speaking of getting geeky, Matt writes, I'm getting ready to upgrade my late 2012 21 inch iMac and I'm favoring the 2018 Mac mini as a reasonably user upgradable option. He says I would buy it with the maxed out CPU, but with the minimum RAM and SSD. And that configuration is currently 929 US dollars on the refurb store. He says I've been running my iMac from an externally enclosed two and a half inch SSD boot drive for years with great results. And that's obviously what I would be looking to do with the mini. My question is, how comfortable would you guys be using an NVMe with an enclosure as an external boot drive? In theory, this should allow for much faster storage since it wouldn't be going through a SATA interface. But I'm not sure if these enclosures are designed for this kind of usage. Any thoughts or recommendations? And yeah, a- absolutely. So first of all, I- yes, the, the mini, the, like for your uses and the way you want to do it, um, I think the mini that you talked about is the right way to go. Definitely buy the maxed out CPU because you can't change that after the fact with the mini, you can change the Ram. Uh, it's not technically user serviceable, but it's sort of, I mean, it's do totally doable. Uh, it is. I have not been into the mini yet to do it, but people say it's a 20 to 30 minute tour. So not terrible. Right. 
And then the SSD going external. That's I, I think that's good. I I would have hedged my bets towards a 256 gig internal, not the 128 gig internal, um, just to have a little more breathing room inside so that I, I kind of have some down the road flexibility. But what you're talking about is totally doable. And for an external NVMe drive, the um, something like the OWC Envoy Pro EX is a good solution, right? Um, because it's Thunderbolt 3, the... Um, I'm trying to think of the uh, I've got a link here, but I mean, I think it does like 2,800 megabytes per second um, with the right NVMe drive in there. So uh, I will look it up while we're talking here. Envoy Pro EX. I have a link, but it doesn't want to work. Now it works. Yeah, 2,500 megabytes a second. Um, did I say megabits before? If I did, please excuse me. 2,500 megabytes per second. It connects, uh, you know, it's using an NVMe drive. So that's fast. And then Thunderbolt three direct. So that's fast and it's portable and you know, all of that good stuff, some bus powered, right. And uh, you can buy it. I think you can buy it empty. Maybe no, maybe not. I, I think yeah, you can I'm buy not seeing that. No, but you, I mean, you know, a, a 480 gig uh, version of this is one ninety nine, uh, one terabyte, 279 2 terabyte 499 so that already that's way cheaper than what you would pay apple for that kind of storage and you get the benefit of being able to sort of upgrade and and do what you want to do so yeah yes john you're breathing heavy it tells me that you've got a thought on this yeah i was searching for one and actually they have one so if i was just doing if I already had an NVMe SSD, which I've had them in the past, because you can put sure. them in your Synology, but uh, I see this one on Amazon, Sabrent. Now I already have some enclosures from these guys. Okay, and they got one here that's uh, yeah, uh, forty-five bucks. Okay, just for and an it's empty. Amazon's choice, and it says Amazon's choice. Got so it. Really, people like it. Got so, it. Uh, got it. Got it. All right. Yeah. So if you've already got the drive, yeah, you're right. I don't see. Um, if you wanted to do this via USB uh, and doing it over USB three, you would be at, um, you know, probably 500 megabytes per second as your uh, as your speed, not not 2500. But that's really fast. I mean, you know, mo your boot drive in your prior machine isn't anywhere near that speed. SSD versus rotational is going to make the biggest difference. The speed of the the data transfer for normal usage, you might not even really notice a difference from 500 to 2,500. Certainly if you bench test it, you know, you will benchmark it rather you will. And, and if you're doing a lot of large files or whatever, sure. But otherwise, you know, the USB C one might work. There's the, the OWC envoy pro for 69 bucks empty. And then you can put a, you know, a, um, a drive in there and, and go that way too. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots of options, but, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. I like it. I like it. It's good stuff. It's fun. This is what I love about, um, about the, you know, the, the everything. Speaking of OWC, I spoke to OWC and I actually put up a little video of Larry showing off their Mercury elite pro Thunderbolt three dock, which is freaking awesome by the way uh so i'll put a link to that video but um you know i've had this problem recording the show where my usb uh interface will just reset right especially those of you in the live stream but even those of you on the regular stream like you've had to hear us talk about it even though we chopped that those parts out of the show if it takes a long time it for and it's been inconsistent well when I was talking to Larry, we were, we were talking about, it. he's like, oh yeah, you know, we ran into this weird problem. He just happened to mention it where we saw that an iPhone using one of the newer LTE bands would interfere with the uh, Thunderbolt two bus on that dock. And it would make it look like you had a power reset. And he's like, so we had to like do a lot of testing. And he's like, now of course they, they, you know, they've, uh, put shielding into their Thunderbolt two docks uh, that protects theirs. He, he wasn't sure if anybody in any other vendors had, had put shielding in because you know, he's out of VC, but um, 
but you know, they, they figured it out. And this is one of the things we love about them is the, 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 the folks at OWC are obsessive about this stuff. And it, it comes from the top. Larry loves to be obsessive about it too. He's, he's a geek like us. And uh, as he's telling me this, my eyes are opening wider and wider. Like, wait a minute. That's my problem. When my phone is too close to my Thunderbolt two dock. And of course I have one of their original ones because you know, I've had it forever. And so mine doesn't have that shielding and it, I've never sent it back to get the shielding put on or anything. Cause I didn't know it was a thing. And so I don't like to have my phone close to me anyway, when I'm recording, because you know, I am recording. I don't need my phone, but sometimes I'll grab it or whatever. And then it gets closer and closer to the dock. And, uh, and so our working theory is that that's what the problem has been. So I will, I will endeavor to keep the phone away from the dock, but, um, but fascinating. Right. So I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, let's see. Mercury Elite Pro was the thing I mentioned, right? So I will. will I'll put that video in the in the show notes. Larry talks through. It's such a great little dock. It's a Thunderbolt three dock and a dual drive RAID all in one, and it starts at two ninety nine ninety nine empty, right? And then you can put drives in it. But like for a Thunderbolt three dock, that's already like, you know, you're not paying very much to add raid capabilities and ex and all that external storage and, uh, you know, possibility and all that stuff. So it's pretty cool. All right, John, where are we here? We have time for one more. And I think Darius will probably actually no, And we're going to do Eric. We'll, we'll do Darius next week. Um, Eric's question is a good one, I think, because Eric asks, he says, um, I use a utility called IPA palette, which is a menu bar item that appears under the flag icon when installed. It's one of the best ways he says of finding and using obscure characters from the international phonetic alphabet IPA. He says, which I happen to use constantly in my job. Uh, he says, here's the thing. The app is installed inside home library input methods. And he says the app was updated recently. And when I tried to install the update, I ran into a weird issue. The app can't install into the input methods folder because for some reason, this folder and only this folder has the little red circle with the white horizontal bar icon on it that says, I don't have permission to even open this folder. He says, though I have full admin privileges on my Mac and I'm running the most for up to date version of Catalina. Do you have any idea What's going on? He says, unless I can get access to this folder, I don't think I can update my IPA palette. All right. So digging into this, John, the first thing I did was looked on my system to see if that for whatever reason, that folder is like off limits to us as users in general. And the answer is no, I can, I can open mine. I could put things in it. I have full right access to it. So I took a look at the permissions for that folder and sure enough, my user, which on my Mac that I tested is called Dave has read and write privileges. And then everyone, which is everyone else, the group of everyone has no access. So I trump the group of everyone and therefore I can read and write. No problem. So I'm not sure what Eric says, but when you're troubleshooting something like this, that's the first thing to do is highlight uh, in, in this case, the folder, but it might be a file. Highlight the file, go to the file menu and go to get info and take a look at the bottom. You might have to twist open sharing and permissions there so that you can see what the list is. And then it also gives you a summary of it where on mine it says you can read and write, which is a great sort of helpful thing. You can also. Now that's weird because so everything on my system appears identical except on my system, Dave. Yes. It says you have custom access. Oh, interesting. So you've messed with it. No. Oh, on my night, it says I have custom access too on, on this machine here, which is interesting. But oh, this when you posted says you can read and write. So that's kind of weird. That well, there's, having... there's a difference. I'm on my uh, studio machine here, which was, um, I'm trying to think, was this one? You folks are going to have to help me remember. No, this was a, a fresh install of Catalina. There was no migration assistant here. Um, I did migration assistant on my machine in the office where it says you can read and write, but, um, but in either case, like all, all, you know, all three of the computers we're talking about yours and the two of mine on Catalina, we have the ability to, um, 
to to you know to read and write to this folder. So, with that in mind, you should be able to read and write to this folder, Eric, and you can't. So after testing this, you could look there and maybe make a change to the sharing and permissions. It might be as simple as highlighting yourself. You might have need to hit the lock in the lower right hand corner uh, to give yourself permission, but then you might need to, you might be able to highlight yourself and cha just change your privilege to read and write. And that might do it. If that doesn't do it though, delete the folder. Sometimes the finder oftentimes, in fact, when you try to delete a folder that you don't have access to, uh, the finder will ask you as an administrator to authenticate. And when you do that, then it sort of overrides everything. Um, yes, Catalina makes some changes to what you have right and uh, right access to and don't. But that's part of the system volume. This is not. This is part of your user folder. So it's it's it should be separate from any of that. So just try to delete the folder. Uh, my guess is you will be able to with an with a proper authentication. Uh, um. And and then just recreate it, you know, input space methods with capital I, capital M. And I think that would that would solve it. That's what I would do. That's that's now sort of the path delete I would it take. From the, now, you can either delete it from the GUI, you know, highlight it and hold down yeah. command delete or drag it to the trash or drag it to the trash. Or you may have to go you may have to go into the command line and do a pseudo space RM space. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, but that I mean, the finder is usually pretty good at saying yeah. you don't have yeah, access. It'll, prompt, it'll so, prompt you if you need special. Let, yeah. Let's sudo up here and, and do it. So, yeah. But yeah, you're right. And uh, and there's and then there's uh, third party apps that that'll help you delete, too. And of course, because we're in the midst of recording the show, I can't think of one yeah. off the top of my head. But that's they, weird, they though. I wonder if that's a stale icon because. Well, no, it's working. I mean, it's working the way the icon says. Right. He cannot make changes to it. So it's not stale. That's 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 as it is. Oh, right. Wait. Oh, no, we don't have a picture of his. OK. Yeah, we, we do have a picture of his icon. We oh, don't wait, have wait. a picture of his get info. So. Right. Right. OK. So I bet you. Yeah, he, he doesn't have. Permission. Yeah. But so you might be as simple as just changing him. You might not even have to delete anything. But um, but deleting it would be the next sort of the next step. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah craziness but that's you know that's what we deal with here we have a lot more stuff to go through but but we just can't do it today because we're at the end john so i guess we're gonna have to do this again next week how's that sound to you uh, ah. <laughs> okay all right well there we are we'll bring the band in because they're uh they're getting warm out in the sun actually it might be raining out there now i know it was supposed to rain a lot here today so it's nice though because all the snow we had like for whatever reason during the, the last storm uh it just kept like coming and stopping, and coming and stopping, and it, and it we wound up with like these just mounds of ice uh, in the middle of our driveway that obviously we just these ice flows that we couldn't get rid of, and so sixty degrees and a little bit of rain uh, takes care of it in short order, which is which is great because what happens is while while we were away at CES, John, uh, we were getting sort of daily dustings of snow. And the problem is when you have these ice flows and then you get, you know, a quarter inch of snow that covers the entire driveway. When you're walking across it, you don't see where the ice is and you wind up falling because it's ice with a thin layer of snow on it. And especially once you've got some snow sort of stuck in the in the, the treads of your shoes. No bueno. So it's nice <sighs> to have that go away. All right, Mr. Braun is uh, dealing with whatever he picked up on during his travels, and I'm dealing with whatever I picked up a month and a half ago. The the, the, the crazy cold this yeah. year is, is I muted. I muted as, as you probably noted. I muted when I had to. Uh, That's good. Hawk, hawk up a loogie. Oh, why? Oh, sorry. Why did he say that? Why? Why, folks? <laughs> why? I just wanted to give you the visual on that. Thanks. Yeah. No, we appreciate it. They post a picture. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can check us out on Twitter at Mac Geek. Uh, I don't know what you're going to find if you check out John F. Braun on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, I do know what you'll find if you check out Dave Hamilton on Twitter this week. Of course, it's probably a lot of stuff about the late, great Neil Peart's passing. Uh, and thank you, Neil, for everything. Uh, we'll talk more about that on Gig Gab tomorrow, my podcast that I do with Paul Kent for working musicians. So go and listen to that if you're if you're into that sort of thing. Thanks to everyone who listened. Thanks to all of you who sent in your comments and such to feedback at macgeekgab.com. That is feedback 
at MacGeekGab.com. That is feedback at MacGeekGab.com, unless you are a MacGeekGab premium contributor, in which case premium at MacGeekGab.com is for you. Thanks to, uh, again, all of our CES sponsors, iMazing, Otherworld Computing, Text Expander, Carbon Copy Cloner, and thanks to thanks to all of you for listening again, of course. And thanks to all of our sponsors for this episode, which, of course, include simplysafe.com slash MacGeekGab, mintmobile.com slash MGG, linode.com slash MGG, and barebones.com. Of course, others in the marketplace include eero.com slash MGG, smilesoftware.com slash podcast. More, more, more. It's good. Thank you so much for everything, folks. And we will see you, well, next week as we decided, because that's just how it goes. But between now and then, do us a favor. Send in your questions. Collect your tips. Send those to us. Send us cool stuff found. All of that stuff. Have fun while you're doing it all. But no matter what, no matter what, make sure that you follow this one piece of advice that's universal. Don't get caught. Made up.